Want to patent your invention? The chance is near. You've given it heart. Now get it in gear. It's Passage to Profit with Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart. Well, welcome to Passage to Profit. The Inventor's Show. Where we're all about intellectual property and new businesses and the challenges that they bring. That's right. And if you have a trademark, copyright, patent that you need help with, or you just want general intellectual property advice, or somebody's threatening to sue you because you're infringing or whatever, this is the guy. Absolutely. <laughs> I, I have no shame when it comes to that. And by the way, Governor Cuomo, Governor Murphy, if you're listening out there, I'm sure they are. <laughs> I need a haircut and I will absolutely agree to stay in quarantine an extra month if you can just get me to a barber because this is driving me crazy. Okay. So please, please, please um, help us out here. But if you're not Governor Murphy, if you're not Governor Cuomo, and or even if you are, and you have an intellectual property project or an entrepreneurial project, you're in the right place because Passage to Profit is all about entrepreneurs and entrepreneurism. And today we're going to do things a little bit differently. We're in quarantine. So this is the first quarantine show that we've done in a while. And Elizabeth and I are here at the office at Gerhardt Law, but our employees are safely at home. We feel that this is like the right level of social distancing, don't you? <laughs> Actually, we could get even a little closer. Uh, <laughs> I, I think we're fine. Okay. So um, we're going to start with IP in the news. And hallelujah, everybody. The USPTO has ruled that artificial intelligence cannot be named as an inventor on a patent. Yay. What about artificial unintelligence? <laughs> yeah, well that, yeah. um, but seriously, there was an article on theverge.com mm -hmm. by John Porter, and Europe had already decided this. Right. So people are asking, why would somebody want artificial intelligence to be an inventor on a patent? That's you know kind of weird. There is a society. They are called the Artificial Inventor and, Project. And let me guess, they are wanting... Uh, artificial intelligence projects and creations to be patentable. They do. And their reasoning is, what if a whole bunch of people work on something and they feed a bunch of data into the computer and the program comes up with this amazing invention, can it be patented? They, what if there's thousands of inventors? Are all thousands of those people who fed code in or did whatever, are they all inventors? So couldn't the artificial intelligence be the inventor and cover all those people? I think that's like one of the most ridiculous things I've ever heard of. I think if you want to like, if you want to let uh, computers get patents, then you should just change the rules so that computers can get patents, right? I think that's the way to approach that. The bigger question is, is do you want computers to get patents? You know, I get all uh, scary because I think of like Skynet, right? Patenting everything. <laughs> and then we're all just like living in our little cubicles and whatnot. And uh, because these computers just keep cranking out those patents and they own well, everything. You are safe for now. <laughs> so, so let's move on to our next topic. All right. Which is yours. Oh, my topic. Yes, it's uh, Google versus Oracle. And that's another software issue. And so it's one of these disputes that's been going on for a long time. It's up at the Supreme Court level now. And it's all about whether co certain types of copyright uh, software is copyrightable, for example, uh, APIs, which are like these little snippets of computer program that like for Google Maps, if they're, somebody's writing a program, they want to put a Google Maps icon in the website, they just put this app API in there and it shows up. And then if you uh, want to have a shopping cart, that's like another snippet of program code that they just put into the uh, website. Oracle developed all of these things. They put it out there for free for everybody to use. Google started using it. Oracle changed its mind when they couldn't reach a deal, well, and then there was a big lawsuit on it. Well, I think actually what happened was it was Sun Microsystems, and then Oracle bought them. Oh, okay. So, so when what, they developed Java, Oracle now is yeah, the, it's Oracle now. So I think maybe Sun Microsystems, I don't know for sure. I don't know the history. Maybe they were a little more generous than <laughs> Oracle. I don't know. But then Google's made a lot of money off these. So I, I know. It was <laughs> like, like a, they offered $40 million to get this resolved. And this was like seven or eight years ago. That's a lot of money seven or eight years ago right. uh, for something that was originally in the public domain. But it is now before the Supreme Court and they're going to decide this. And I guess if you're a computer programmer programming APIs, that's a big issue. But it's also 
a big issue about how keeping everything open makes it standardized. And if you standardize things, then software development can happen a lot more quickly. So and it's a, lot uh, easier. A, a big issue and one to watch. So um, we'll let you know what happens if the Supreme Court ever goes back in session. Right. So they, they actually brought up, Google brought up two things. One, API should not be copyrightable because they're not just an expression of your whatever, which is what copyrights are, but it's actually a utility because it's an interface. So it shouldn't even get a copyright to begin with. But if it does get a copyright, <laughs> then then they can use it under fair use standard. Yeah, fair use is that's usually non-commercial use. So if you want to use an article in a classroom, then you're not infringing that copyright because that's considered fair use. And so somehow, some way, Google is trying to make this contorted fair use argument, which makes no sense because this is like totally commercial and it's not anywhere close to the law. So if they win, it's going to be on that issue. It's going to be because the Supreme Court changes the law. So um, has a lot of ramifications for software coding going forward, what people can do, what they can't do. And uh, I hope that the Supreme Court finds against Google and finds for Oracle. I just think that's the way it should go. But they won't listen to me. So uh, we'll, see. we'll see what they have to say. Yeah. So we actually, we have two people here with us today, which is a little bit different. They're both guest level because they're both expert podcasters. And we're doing this, as you can see, not in the studio. So we need people that know what they're doing, unlike us. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we have Sid Badia is going to go first. But we also have Carrie Barrett. So Carrie, you should feel free to pitch in while we're interviewing Sid and ask any questions that you would like. Anything? And, yeah, same, same with you, Sid, with Carrie. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm all ears. On. <laughs> so Sid, welcome to the show. It's uh, good to see you just met recently because uh, the law firm is going to be doing an event in your room and it's yeah. interesting technology it's taking the idea of a uh, virtual next networking to a whole nother level so maybe you could tell us about the project you're working on now and uh, how it works and we'd love to hear about it elizabeth and richard thank you for having me on your show first of all and hopefully we make it to iHeart. And secondly, I hope I get a haircut too. So just straight up, I have the same issue as you. So um, I'm actually, uh, Switch Events is the brand that I hold all the events under. And Switch Events is about a year and change old uh, entity that I was created for all these networking events. We were hosting in-person events. And then clearly all the virtual stuff had to kick off because of all the changes in uh, social distancing and so forth. So uh, I picked a platform, which is uh, a remote conference. And uh, within, I'd say, a week and a half of my last in-person event, I moved over everything virtual. And I tested out nine platforms before picking Remo. And for me, the concept was pretty straightforward. The end user needed to really feel that level of networking as if you were walking into an event. And, you know, both of you have tried it. Uh, I'm not sure, Carrie, if you have or not yet. But basically, uh, when you're walking into a networking event and you see a group of two or six people or whatever it is, and then you finish talking with those groups of people, and then you say, all right, I want to go meet the next batch. That's what this platform brings. So it's not like the so-called Zooms or the Cisco's or those type of platforms. This is a table-style setup, and it's worked well. I just actually today completed uh, the ninth event in the last two months. And uh, it's been going pretty well. Of course, there's glitches. It's a computer software at the end of the day. But you know what? I've had my fair share of all the other ones. And every presentation, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so that's it. And I'm so pleased that, you know, uh, you got the opportunity to experience it. And hopefully it gave a different value to your networking experience. Well, it did because I was on one of these last night on join me and you can't network on that. I mean, people were chatting away the chat and it was distracting on that software. The chat room thing kept like, you know, and, and you're kind of like, you know, I'm trying to watch the presentation. I don't want to see all these comments. Yeah. Um, but people couldn't really talk to each other otherwise. And so there wasn't a, the networking component, which I've actually made some new friends through this people that I didn't know. And I, I find it, it's not quite as good as in-person networking, but it really is the next best thing. Yeah, yeah. And the other thing is, um, talking about the thing you said about the chat features and things like that, you know, where this platform brings versus the other ones that I've tested is the subtlety, right? If you want to leave a table, if you want to stop talking with a group of people, you quickly send a quick message to that chat 
within that table, not the whole thing, and boom, you can walk out quietly. You know, you can't do that in, in a thing like a Zoom or something like that. If you really try to focus in on all those things. So as, as an event organizer, I look at the smallest things to make sure that your, you know, Elizabeth, Rich, and Carrie, your networking experience is of quality. Because my job, I look at it this way, is to make sure that you made that quality connection while we're still using a platform during these times. Um, is there a way that you can describe in a little bit more detail what the interface of the networking platform looks like uh, understanding that our, our viewers are not able to see the mm -hmm. form right this minute. Could you describe it in a little bit more detail? Basically, the platform is set up where it, each its individual floors, you could fit about 800 people total on this platform. Actually, it looks like a room. It looks like a... a it, well, that's... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So... It actually look, makes it look like a room that has different floors and different tables, right? So and that's the big, I guess, uh, purpose of this. So it looks like you're walking into a cocktail reception or some type of a dinner table setup. And you go from table one, let's say. And if not tables, there's also couches. I don't know if you've noticed that as well. Oh, so there's a little bit of a lounge experience as well. <laughs> so, so the thing about the tables, too, that's very cool is that you see only the people you see their videos, only the people that are at your table. So if there's three people at your table, there'll be three videos on the screen. So you can talk to each other. Mm -hmm. It's just so much more manageable. Yes. And so they, I mean, the other platforms do have what they call the breakout rooms, right? Mm -hmm. In other platforms. But what this one is, is the entire platform is a breakout room. Mm -hmm. And then for the presenters, so let's say, Elizabeth, you're planning to host, or you've been to a couple of them. We have presenters that come on. Mm -hmm. I then set it up to presentation mode where the, all the audience members now just see that one person. So it's not like, you know, you're, you're talking here and this person's talking here and this, you know, uh, Johnny on the corner is talking here on the Zoom calls and you're sitting and trying to figure out who do I listen to, you know? Um, and so there, there, it gives a little uh, value of exclusivity. I hosted a, a LinkedIn networking event and I believe so, Elizabeth, you were there. Mm -hmm. we, had, uh, we had over t 275 people on that platform as well that day. And uh, I have another, I have a virtual uh, job fair coming up as well that we're already set up. It's going to be north of 200 people on that as well. So this isn't just a networking platform. Uh, we are hosting comedy events on here. There's going to be a comedy event tomorrow. We're considering doing a festival, uh, trying out different ideas. And uh, so this is going to be a bigger future because I think this is part, I wouldn't call it the new normal. I'd say it's going to be part of whatever that normal is going to be. It's amazing what you can do. I think even just five years ago, we wouldn't have had these options. And I know everybody's getting tired of being on video and feeling like they're constantly performing all the time. But the fact that we even said, I've never been on the platform that you're talking about, but as soon as we shut this down, I'm going to go check it out because it sounds amazing. And I think it's, it's important to recognize that we do have these options to connect that we didn't have before and figure figuring out how they work and making the best use of them is, is ideal. And it, it sounds like you have said, you have, you've got it all figured out, man. I need to talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 this is how crazy the story is. So my Tuesday event was the last event I had in person. This was yeah. two months ago. That Thursday, you know, we officially, I think Thursday or Wednesday, we hit like a pandemic officially on the news. Yeah. The weekend I tested out all the different platforms. Tuesday, I had 31 people testing Remo, and, and that Friday, I hosted my first event. So it was pretty smooth. I mean, was it easy to get your arms around it and figure out how to use yeah, it? it? Yeah, it was. The only thing is, of course, you know, it's a, it's a computer software. LinkedIn is having its own problems, and LinkedIn right. is LinkedIn. You know, so thing is, you have to keep those things in mind and say, all right, why is it not working this way? Why is it not working that way? Yeah. But then Cisco, the other day, I had a meeting on Cisco, and I couldn't even get on, period. That's the thing. I, I feel I had, a, I had a webinar on Zoom earlier this week. I had one, I was hosting two in it back to back. And the first one, everybody had issues. Nobody, I couldn't see anybody. They were having trouble with the mic. The co-host couldn't access his video. And then this, the second webinar, which was directly after that with, a, with another group, all the same settings, everybody could access their video. And I, it, I, I think it was, I, I don't know what was going on, but I, there are little bugs, and I think as each system gets overwhelmed and there's more people on it and more people using Wi-Fi, there's issues with lag and audio and everything else. Yeah. 
but they'll work those things out eventually. And these types of uh, technologies will continue to move forward and work for people. We are so excited that we're able to have our Global Intellectual Property Law Symposium. It's G-I-P-L-S. We call it, nickname it Gipples for short. <laughs> and what we've done in the past, the firm has invited intellectual property professionals from different countries. And then we all jam on intellectual property for an hour. Believe it or not, there's an audience for that. Well, and but, business, and, too. And business, Not too. just the IP part, but it's so, the business and, part, too. And so we decided to have this event, but just in terms of logistics, having people who are able to participate, not get on a flight, fly all the way over, hotels, expenses, scheduling. The pre-conference dinners were a lot of fun. I'm going to miss those. But <laughs> really was, it, it, this is really a fantastic tool. And we really, because of yeah. all of the logistical challenges, put this project on hold a couple of years ago. But now we're back because the software is so much easier well, to use. And we hope to be able to keep doing those. Well, I will say the only reason that we really are trying this and I because I'm in charge of these events as marketing is because Sid has people there to help <laughs> you. Up. So he gives you people to help you with your events. So we're yeah. basically renting the room from Sid who has it on his switch platform on the Remo yeah. platform. And so when you rent the room from Sid you also get people that will take care of all these things. And yeah. It's a great deal. Yeah, it is a good deal. Of course, deal. we're not going to have waiters walking out with hors d'oeuvres, but we'll take whatever we get. I can get my kids. Mm -hmm. My kids will serve me hors d'oeuvres. <laughs> It'll be almost the same. This is how crazy it's going to sound. I was just at a tech conference on this platform that had close to 9,000 people on it. There was seven actual bridges between different platforms to jump off of because this each, each kind of concept only fits 800. So there were so many other ones open. I think, but Sid, and correct me if I'm wrong, I, I think that this leads to, and I know the word new normal is super overused right now, and I cringe every time I say it and hear it coming out of my mouth. But after we move past this and we hit new normal, I think this opens up a whole bunch of opportunities for people who have been right? Not only for businesses who are looking to maybe reduce their footprint, right? They see, they see a way that they can cut costs and save money, but also for people who have been pushing for a long time to have the ability to work from home or to have a more flexible kind of work-life balance and schedule, it lends itself to that. Yeah. Would, you, would you agree? Well, totally. And one, one other funny thing that I do, and I think maybe both of you have gotten it. I tell people, jump into my virtual coffee shop. And, and, and people get confused and they're like, what are you talking about? And I said, well, I built a coffee shop on this platform. Basically, you bring your own coffee, right? So I don't. And uh, we basically then start just having our meeting and next to the table next to you, somebody else may be in there doing their own thing. So yeah, this is definitely a, a so-called yeah, game changer. Right. Believe it or not, we've been talking for 15 minutes. <laughs> it's gone so fast. It's gone so fast, but we'll be right back after this break. So stay tuned. You're listening to Passage to Profit with Richard and Elizabeth Gerhardt. We'll be right back after this. There's never been a better time to start your own business. The opportunities are infinite and only limited by your imagination and enthusiasm. At Gearheart Law, we believe the most successful companies all have one thing in common. They start with a solid foundation first. Gearheart Law has years of experience protecting entrepreneurs' ideas and brands using patent, trademark, and copyright protection. So if you have a new consumer product, a new software application that you're planning to build or sell, or a brand or company name that you want to protect, contact the experts at www.gearheartlaw.com. Our professionals will create a custom strategy designed to fit your needs and your budget. All of our attorneys are passionate about protection, licensed and qualified to represent you before the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Don't start your project without calling us first. Visit gearheartlaw.com. Together, we can change the world. Visit G-E-A-R-H-A-R-T-L-A-W.com. This ad has been read by a non-attorney spokesperson. Now back to Passage to Profit. Once again, Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart. Now I get to talk a little bit about a new project I started before COVID hit, but I managed to figure out a way to do it using these tools through COVID. It's the perfect pivot story. It is a good, yeah. So Richard and I have been doing Passage to Profit for almost two years. And what we found happened was people would come in even though it was radio and it was taped, they were still nervous. 
because nobody wants to sound stupid. I mean, sometimes you do, I guess, if you're trying to be funny. But <laughs> Some people want to sound stupid, and they're very good at it. <laughs> I've said sounding stupid. Again. <laughs> but, uh, but our wonderful producer, Noah, cuts that out. But people were still nervous. And by the time they were done, and we started videotaping at iHeart, so we put it on our YouTube. By the time we were done, people were like, oh, that was so much fun. You know, I didn't realize that it could be like that. And so I thought, you know, people need video. They need video more than ever. And this was before COVID. So I started doing video interviews of people to put on a video directory online, a website and a YouTube channel that go hand in hand. It's and an absolute, I can say this because I'm her husband, but it's an absolutely genius idea. <laughs> because if you are a small business owner and you have to work and network, it's really hard because you have to get the work and then you have to do the work and you're always looking for more ways to get the work so that you can do the work that you can get. So if you followed that, you should go to fire, <laughs> fireside dot directory. Fireside so, doc, and, and you can replicate yourself um, to all online persons and they see a video, they get to know you, they get to know what your style is, they get to know what you're, uh, what's important and the people that like you will call you. Or contact you if they don't like you then you probably would have wasted your time anyway so this is really the wave of the future I think and I uh, my, my genius wife uh, you know thought of this I hope so. and so so, so what happened when COVID arrived? so well so before COVID I have a videographer who I adore she's a young woman wow. she was coming to our summit office we have a upstairs that we were using as a video studio and she was videotaping these interviews and then she was editing them and she did wonderful work and they looked very professional, very great. Well, of course we couldn't do that anymore. So I thought, well, everybody's doing everything on Zoom and actually Zoom is making people more comfortable with this stuff. So why don't I just do it on Zoom for now and populate the site, do it for free for everybody. And then after COVID, if people do want a better video, they can come and get a better video. But if they're okay with the Zoom video and if people are accepting of this because everybody's gone through this together, then that, that will be enough. So I actually have had more luck populating the site because people are so willing to do Zoom videos. For some reason, being in front of a videographer is terrifying for most people, not for Carrie or Sid, but <laughs> for most people. Um, and so... I pivoted to the Zoom videos and I was trying to figure out how to make people comfortable on Zoom and tell them how to do it. And I was on LinkedIn and I found this wonderful woman who was shooting these videos and who gave me the tip of my life. Her name's <laughs> Carrie Barrett. She's here with us now. <laughs> she, she said, you, everybody watch this, you need to go in that little arrow and do edit video and go in and do touch up appearance and you won't believe the difference <laughs> <laughs> so carrie welcome why don't you tell us what you've been doing and how you know all this thank you i know it just because i am super hypercritical and so i go through and find every single filter and every single thing i can possibly put on any sort of video i take whether it's on here or whether it's on my computer and um, I try and try and make, I try and hide the fact that I have three children and I haven't slept in a decade. Really, that's what it comes down <laughs> to. So, um, if you have any other suggestions for that, send them my way because I will happily try them out. Um, so I was just I was in Zoom one day as I was prepping for a call, and and to be honest with you, it's you know I have a twenty year career in the news business, but. I'd never done video calls. I mean, occasionally for an interview subject who, you know, we needed to interview immediately and was across the country or whatever. And so we needed to do a video call. But back then it was like Skype. So Zoom was all new to me. And so as I was prepping for some webinars um, that I was going to be, part, you know, participating in, I just started poking around the settings and I saw this touch of my appearance. And I was like, hmm. <laughs> click on that and see what that's all about and I clicked on it and I was like this is amazing and so I posted a little video about it because I knew if I loved it that and hadn't heard of it that uh, probably a, a lot of others were in the same boat and they might find it helpful so um, I will walk you through it right now as well for people who are watching this at home if I have time to do so so if you go onto your zoom platform you go down to the bottom left hand side see a little picture of a video camera there'll be a mic and then a video camera and if you click on the video camera to the right of that, you will see a little carrot. And if you click on the carrot, 
you'll see a couple of settings come up and the bottom one will say video settings. Click on that and then a white window will come up in the middle of your screen. If you go over to the middle of that, you'll see my video and there'll be three settings and it's like HD, mirror my video, and then the bottom one is touch up my, my appearance. And I click on that button and don't ever unclick it. It will be set that way permanently. I don't do any of these without that thing. I'm recording on here and I definitely have it clicked. There you go. It just, you know, it's not, it's, listen, it's not going to give you cat ears and stars in your eyes, but it will just make it look like you are hydrated and not wicked stressed the way that we all are, or most of us anyway. It's like a great tip. So what w advice would you give other uh, video-ers to make their Zoom videos look as good as they possibly can? So there's a couple of really simple things that you can do to make your, to just up level your video without any gear, or if you have a budget for some gear, a minimal expense. So one of the first things that I suggest is framing and framing is we're all framed pretty, we're all in the right place. But for those of you who may be watching or listening and, and don't know what that means, it means when you're in the, in the video box, you need to be in the center of the picture. You need to be almost filling that video box. You don't want to be like back here, this tiny little person who's <laughs> all this dead space around you. You want to have a presence and a sense of authority. And that is assisted by kind of filling up that space. So that means not a lot of headroom at the top. It means framing yourself. I always liken it to what you would see if you were to watch a, like a single news anchor at a news desk, you know, your Lester Hall or your David Muir, whoever your favorite is. And, um, they're always tightly shot, like maybe mid torso, mid chest up. And that's not random. There's a reason for that. The reason for that is it's so the viewers can look in their eyes and it helps establish that like no trust factor. And if you're not allowing the people on the other side of the camera or the person on the other side of the camera to look into your eyes, you might as well just have a phone call because the only purpose of video is to try and help create that connection, especially when we're not able to meet in person. So if you are missing that element, it's a waste of your time. You might as well not get pretty, stay in your pajamas and make a phone call instead. <laughs> so I, I've heard though that so much of communication is nonverbal communication, right? That you really learn a lot about a person just by looking at them, right? And that's why video is such a powerful communication tool. You're absolutely 100% correct. It's surprising, shocking really, how many people forget that. You know, I've seen more than my fair share of pajamas and all, which is fine. I'm on a happy hour with my buds. You know, don't dress at all. You do you. That's fine. But when you're in a room of people who you may potentially work with face to face at some point, probably avoid like the pajamas or the hoodie or or whatever it is, but you're right. There's so much that you can get out of looking at someone's face. And if they can't see your eyes, um, you know, or if you're sitting way back across the other side of the room and your eyes are shifty or whatever, you're not doing yourself any favors. And so it's important to try and use this technology in its fullest capacity to accentuate your communications and make sure that you're getting across what you need to get across. So like, for example, and I'm going to, this is, this is kind of the, the biggest offender of them all. And I'm sure that we have all seen it. It's either this one, <laughs> right? you have this person who's looking up at the camera, like they're a kid looking up at Santa Claus, or you have this one where it's like, hi, you know, it's, just, it's the no shot. And to the heavens. <laughs> yeah, it's almost like they, they don't see themselves. Um, listen, nobody's expecting perfection. You don't need to be perfect. Authenticity is where it's at. But there are, like I said, some really simple things you can do to make sure that your authenticity is actually able to come across, right? Don't sit in front of a brightly lit window because then you're in silhouette. And then there's no point of being in camera anyway because nobody can see your face. So the moral of the story is look at your setup and your picture. And I mean, some of the backgrounds I've seen have just been <laughs> unbelievable. Like, if you're going to show your kitchen, do the dishes, okay? <laughs> Well, you know, and it's and I one of the things I advise is that we we're all figuring out what this means. I am not perfect at it by any shot. Even after twenty years of of a career on camera, I still make mistakes with not only with my setup and my lighting, but the background. But the but the key is sit down, give yourself a little bit of time, and look at the shot and really look at it with a critical eye. If you're not sure what 
um, the composition should be of a shot and you don't have anybody to walk you through it. I mean, I'd be happy to do that if, if people need help with that, but like do, do a quick Google search and find out what the composition should be. You know, the rule of thirds, which is the screen is set up in, in, you know, three equal parts and you should generally be in the middle of it. Um, that's one aspect of composition. I have a consulting business. What, what type of consulting are you doing? It's, it's changed a little bit um, since COVID-19 and coronavirus hit, but I do media training, on-camera readiness, public speaking coaching. Uh, I put together brand stories. I shoot commercial and industrial videos, brand ambassador type pieces. So it's really any sort of presentation that takes place on video and all of the different elements of it. I specifically focus on presentation and messaging and strategy. But if you look at my LinkedIn page, you'll see there's there's brand stories there that I've put together as well that are not too shabby. Um, and so what I've done right now is because all of, all of the in-person public speaking events and one-on-one -on -one coaching and training have, you know, dissolved till who knows when, is I've really pivoted and I've done, a, I've started to do a lot of training about camera presentation. And I think people who wanted to be on CNBC or release their own videos, marketing videos, et cetera, they always understood the importance of camera presentation, but now everybody understands what it means and how it can affect your message. And so I've done more tutorials on Zoom presentation and, and media presentation on camera than I can even count in the past two weeks. And it's also meant that my online courses have spooled up as well. So online courses was always kind of on my to-do list. It was just maybe like nine, 12 months down the road. Now it's two months down the road because I need to I need to figure out how to make up for that public speaking portion that has gone away for the time being and fill it with something else, which is online courses for me right hey, now. You too, Sid, you do that also, right? Yeah. Um, hey, Carrie, so I did want to bring this up to you and maybe Elizabeth and Richard as well, that I actually, because I teach LinkedIn, uh, you know, I had, uh, I get a lot of people always asking me, hey, what do I do? Set up, blah, blah, blah. With the new normal, how should I set it up? So what I did was for... Um, I, it's usually a paid LinkedIn class. It goes into a lot of different depths. What I did was I converted the class into an online free class open for everyone. So I can leave the link. Uh, it's, it's available. It's on Thinkific. That's the website I use. Yep. Um, and, uh, you know, it's just one of those things that it, what you're doing is amazing, by the way. Because you, you knew that carrot thing on the video, which was, I, I don't even know what the word was for that thing. So, <laughs> the carrot. So I'm just impressed, you know. <laughs> I made it up. I don't know if that's what it's called or not, but you uh, got it. That's your you? word now. <laughs> your podcast is C3 Chat. Yes. Could you please spell your name for people? You're on LinkedIn. Yeah, yep. There, right? Yeah, so my first uh, my first name is Sid, S for Sam, I, D for David, and my last name is Vidya, and it's spelled V for Victor, A, I, D for David, Y, A. And I'm on LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, and every other God knows platform out there. I also teach classes and all sorts of other things. And lastly, what Carrie, uh, which Elizabeth, I'm sorry, mentioned, was I host uh, or co-host a podcast called C3 Chat Show, where we interview great people like Elizabeth and Carrie, who have both been on. And, uh, and, and we talk about, you know, entrepreneurial related things. We talk to uh, experts. I just recently had an expert on uh, out in New Zealand who has 450,000 followers on her podcast alone. And she figured out how to design uh, the funnel system on podcasting. So those are topics that, yeah. you know, as an individual, somebody is interested in listening to, you know, and she's successful and figured it out. So these are things that we want to talk about. We have Devin Harris, who's a former Jamaican bobsledder. We just interviewed him. We have so many various different type of people on that we want to try to get an understanding of. Okay, Karen, please spell your name. Please spell your name. I can do that. It's it's the masculine spelling of Carrie, K-E-R-R-Y, um, no I, Y, Barrett, B-A-R-R-E-T-T. -T. You can find me on LinkedIn. You can find me on all of the social media platforms. My website is under construction right now, although there are some fun videos up there, CarrieBarrettConsulting.com. Great. Okay. Well, thanks a lot. And we'll be back right after this message. You're listening to Passage to Profit, The Inventor Show with Richard and Elizabeth Gerhardt. Hi, I'm Lisa Askley, the inventress, founder, CEO, and president of Inventing A to Z. I've been inventing products for over 38 years, hundreds of products later, and dozens of patents. I help people develop products and put them on the market from concept to fruition. 
I bring them to some of the top shopping networks in the world, QVC, HSN, Evine Live, and retail stores. Have you ever said to yourself, someone should invent that thing? Well, I say, why not make it you? If you want to know how to develop a product from concept to fruition the right way, contact me, Lisa Askeles, the inventress. Go to inventingatoz.com, inventingatoz.com. Email me, lisa at inventingatoz.com. Treat yourself to a day chock full of networking, education, music, shopping, and fun. Go to my website, inventingatoz.com. This is Howie Bush from Dude Robe. Passage to Profit is awesome. Passage to Profit continues with Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart. So welcome back, everybody. Welcome back. Sid just sent a link to a class that he made. Sid, could you say what that link is? I see it in the chat. but Yeah, yeah. So that was the link uh, to the Thinkific class, in case you want to share it with anyone. Again, I teach, uh, you know, in this class, we talk about very basic things. You get a LinkedIn profile image, a banner how to set up your headline, how to set up your profile. Because I think a lot of people right now are saying, oh, I need to get back in, you know, prospect mode or relationship development mode. And, you know, enough Zoom calls and maybe we should just get onto LinkedIn and just connect with the right people. But I look at people's profiles now, like in depth. And I don't want to go and connect with somebody who doesn't really care about their profile because that means they don't care about themselves. Right. I was telling Richard about your 50-50-50 for LinkedIn about... You reach out to 50 people. Part of it, you'd have to. Yeah, so I'll, I'll mention that. I was talking to Richard. One thing I said is I go into my groups and find people that are posting, and those are the people I invite. The 50-50-50 rule is simple. It's 50 minutes a minimum a day on LinkedIn. Wow. Minimum a day on LinkedIn. Mm-hmm. And believe me, the rest of the 50, it'll be a reason why. 50 minutes a day minimum on LinkedIn. 50 quality engagements. May it be a post that you make. May I be commenting, likes don't count. And the last 50 is 50 new outbound connections on LinkedIn. A week. Wow. A week. And yeah, those two are a week. So you have 10,000 followers, right? I'm, catch, I'm noticing on LinkedIn, there's just been so much pickup because a lot of people are trying to understand it better and use it. And just in the last five days, since Monday, we're recording Friday, Monday, I picked up 400 new followers. That's more a- than 400, actually. That's amazing. And how long did it take you, though, to get to 10,000? Three years. Three years. I picked up, I I designed the 50-50-50. It was uh, about a year and a half ago. Before that, I realized that it was just a lot of actual commenting and things like that that had developed it. But then as I started posting, it's amazing. There's a very, very small population of the entire LinkedIn cosmos, about 675 million people out there that use LinkedIn. They actually create content. And I post two to three times a day. Wow. Mm-hmm. So each, each one of my posts does about 1,000 to 3,000 views. So now you can get a sense of per day, I'm catching about five to 10,000 people. So what about you, Carrie? Yeah, Sid, you're amazing. What about you, Carrie? Because you're posting a lot as well, right? I, I mean, I just started my LinkedIn account probably a little less than a year ago. I post a lot of video content. I post at least once a day during the week, um, oftentimes two times a day. If there's a post that's performing especially well though, I, I, don't, I don't create an obstacle to get to that post by putting another one up. I wait until the engagement starts to die down and then I'll put another video up. I have about, um, I don't have 10,000. <laughs> I have probably have about 2,300 right now that I picked up in the last year. Oh, exactly. And I, I, I noticed what I have noticed is that as your audience begins to grow and you put, right, my, my goal is anytime I put something out there, I run it through a couple of quick checks in my head. And that is, if I saw this, would this be I would share with somebody else? Or would this be something I would want somebody else to know? And that's, I try not to post anything that doesn't pass that litmus test. And if you can get it to pass that litmus test, then other people will share your engagement and they'll share your posts or they'll comment or whatever it is. And then as you grow a bigger audience, that just it organically builds upon itself. And so things just begin to pick up speed as you gain more interest from people who are watching your content and you engage with them as well. That's really great advice because one of the questions that I wanted to ask both of you was, you know, there's so much content out there now. And so how do you get your content to kind of break through a little bit so that you get noticed a little bit so you can market your products or 
services or advice or whatever it is that you're trying to communicate about? There is a lot of noise out there right now. I mean, a lot, a lot that you're trying to break through way more than usual even. And so there's a couple of things that I do. One is I try and I don't just throw up random hashtags. Um, ha hashtags should be strategic and they are important. And there's a few that I always post, empower your performance is a hashtag that I post on anything that I put anywhere, whether it is Facebook or Twitter or YouTube or LinkedIn. And so all of my content can be tracked by that hashtag on whatever platform you're on. But then there are certain hashtags that I know, like when coronavirus first hit the news, if you will, that was a huge hashtag. So I, I try to capitalize on that. Um, now I don't use that so much anymore because it's, it's overused. There's other options out there. I also tag people that I think um, the content is relevant to. So, so as a way to bring it to their attention over perhaps some of the other content that they have flooding their feeds. And so if I think it, if it's a brand story and it's somebody who has talked to me about doing a brand story but hasn't you know pulled the trigger yet, I'll, t I'll tag them and then I'll tag other, you know, other marketing firms or people who are interested in doing video but haven't done it yet. So it gets their attention and then also hopefully it's something that they share with their followers as well. That's awesome advice, Carrie. I'm, I'm in the same boat as you. I'll add to that. I, I do love to uh, put in specific brand related tags. So hashtag SidTip is my brand, right? And uh, so on majority of my posts, I try to include that in there. I found both of you through your content. So Carrie, I'm not sure how you came up on my feed, but I mean, I think you, somebody liked something that you did who was on in my group. And so then I saw, I liked it. So then I started following you. Sid, I, Janae Iqbal was actually on Passage to Profit in New York, I don't know, a year or so ago. And he liked one of your posts and he was in my group. And so I saw your post and then I started following you because you both have excellent content and it's relevant and it's, it's not too long and it's something that people, it's stuff people really need to know. Okay, one thing that I forgot to mention that I really should is when I post content, I, I try and, I try and make sure that it contains three elements. And these three elements are that it is timely, right? It's something that's, that's relevant right now. It's something that people are interested in and perhaps already talking about around the virtual water cooler, if you will. And then there is some element of emotion in there, whether it is joy or motivation or sadness or anger. There's a lot of that right now as well. I try and make sure that those three elements are in every post in some fashion, whether it's through the story I tell or through the story a client is telling that I'm posting. But I find when those three elements are included, it makes a big difference. Yeah. Hey, uh, also, Elizabeth, one thing I do want to add, and probably the reason why you may have liked what I posted was uh, actually it's two different things. One, as like Carrie mentioned, when, you, when you're doing those tags and things, you're building a community. Mm -hmm. And now that you're praying and hoping that that community, as they post, they now get you involved, right? And things like that. So it's important to build in a community. And that's all that, you know, fancy words they call engagement. That's what this is, right? And yeah. the second thing I wanted to bring was that when you're posting, also keep in mind that it is a computer software. So a lot of people think that, oh, like in my case, 10,000 followers, all 10,000 are supposed to get it. But go and do a little bit of deep dive on these computer softwares like Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, all these only maybe 15 to 20% of your entire follower base actually get it. Yep. Who gets it? You don't know, mm -hmm. but that's who gets it. So you're praying and banking on somebody to actually get it. But just to clarify, the software program is only sending it to a portion yeah. of your followers. It's not sending it to all of them. Right. But the more, the more something is, is engaged with, the higher the algorithm boosts everything. So that's the whole goal, right? If you have something that only gets one or two likes, LinkedIn ain't putting it anywhere. Yep. But if you get something that gets 30 likes, the algorithm in LinkedIn will recognize this as an important post, one that people are interested in and one that would benefit LinkedIn's community as a whole. Mm -hmm. And so they up the algorithm and it goes to more people. If you add links on your, if you tag too many people, if you spam too many hashtags, this whole science behind this, because at the end of the day, they're a computer program. That's the yeah, most they are. Very, you know? very, very true. And I, I will say this, if somebody, if somebody tags you in, in a post, try and share it or comment because yeah. that's the reason they're doing it. And 
And hopefully then when, when you have something and you tag them, they return the favor. It's, it's to build the conversation. So they're not just tagging you because they want you to take a look at it. Yeah, they want that, but they also want your help in broadcasting their message. And hopefully you can do the same for them and they can, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it, it works both ways. Well, that's funny because Sid had that question on one of his posts today and I answered it and I said, it really bothers me when I like every post of somebody's and I comment and they don't ever do it back and yeah. eventually I just quit liking their stuff. Yeah. 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 If you don't see me commenting right away, it's because I, I um, because of my class and what I educate people on, I play with the algorithm. So there's things that I do, I'll intentionally do it. And that's why I post so frequently because I test the, the, the system. So then people like Carrie call me and say, hey, Sid, what do you think about this? I give her my advice based on what I've tested already. Mm -hmm. well, let me ask you this question with um, 10,000 LinkedIn followers. Does the amount of energy and work that you have to put into a community of that size increase the more followers that you get? Because uh, right now we're in the process of building the Instagram page for Passage to Profit. And we're spending a lot of time, you know, reaching out and liking and following and commenting. And it, But the more followers we get, the more of it is, is involved in that, right? So yeah, uh, one, one simple thing. So and Carrie has, I think, a bigger Instagram following than I do at this moment. So Carrie, you're welcome to jump in. But one thing I will say, so when I started my Instagram journey, uh, last year, so 2019 January, I started it. Okay, uh, before that, I mean, I was using LinkedIn for a much longer period, but Instagram, I really started focusing in on it. But from January to March, I was posting seven times a day, posting seven times a day, and my stories it would be like 20 stories. I went from no, uh, well, when I said no, it probably was my personal account, so like 20 followers to over 7,000 in three months, and then I took a month off. And I lost over 70% of them. I have a following and I have a, I have a verified account just because of my news days. That's, that's why that is. And having that blue check mark does do some things for you in terms of boost your comments and your posts a little bit. And it also gives you a couple of bells and whistles on Instagram that not everybody has access to until you hit a certain number of followers or you, or you get a blue check mark. But I post once a day, usually on LinkedIn, but what I have, and I used to never do stories, which Sid, you mentioned it's the, it's the little windows at the, you know, the little videos at the top that disappear after 24 hours unless you, unless you dump them into a highlights bucket. And I'm getting a little into the weeds right now, but um, I find the engagement with Instagram stories is so much greater because they're right at the top. And if people haven't seen them yet, they got a little red circle around them and people know that you have some new content up there that's right at the top of their screen and they click on it and it just goes right through. Now it'll, it posts in 15 second increments, but if you shoot like a one minute long video, it'll automatically chop it up into like four 15 second ish increments and then post them all one after the other. But you can add hashtags and you can, you know, tag people and you can, Instagram's fun. Um, yeah. You can add all sorts of graphics and create polls and methods to engage people. My next, my next challenge is TikTok. I just started a TikTok account today, but I, I got to, you know, I'm like figuring out how I can use my knowledge to grow, you know, a following there and also yeah. make it fun and interesting. I mean, it's a much younger demo. So, you know, do I, do I need to show pictures um. of my my dog barfing. I'm not sure. <laughs> I, I don't I, know what, what's going to hit on that yet, but I'll keep you posted. It's funny, Carrie. I started a TikTok a couple of months ago and I'm at 40 followers, about 1200 likes or whatever. Nice. And it's a, it's a fun platform. It is fun, you know? right? Yeah. And it's addicting. You just kind of flipping the channels to see all the videos, but uh, about Instagram, I want to just jump a last piece. And uh, um, I actually changed my method on Instagram after that experience mm -hmm. to just focus on stories and build what I would personally consider people that actually want to follow me. Cause I started realizing that how did I go in three months from 7,000 followers and then went straight down to like about under 3000 that quickly. That means that where is the actual organic piece to that, those platforms, you know, whereas LinkedIn, those followers don't just disappear when I stop posting. Yeah. So, so then I realized that, you know what, the people that are following me, let me start putting up more stories. And give them the story behind Sid on a daily day, you know, basis. So I'm posting three to 10 to 15 stories a day now, you know, 
and I just not really big into posting on Instagram like I used to be. Yeah, makes a big difference. Very interesting. I love when you post stories, by the way, because I always share them. It makes it makes my job Thank easier. <laughs> this has been absolutely wonderful, and we're so glad that you're able to join us today. And uh, Carrie and Sid, thanks so much. Where can Thank people you. reach you again? LinkedIn is the fastest method. I always tell people the moment you send me a message, it, it appears right on here. So I really get it. And again, Sid Vidya, if you will have me on the show notes or my name, that's the quickest and fastest way. This face won't change. So you'll find me there. Um, and that's, that's the easiest way. I'm on LinkedIn as well. Carrie, K-E-R-R-Y Barrett, B-A-R-R-E-T-T. Same spelling across all platforms. Um, YouTube, LinkedIn, Instagram, yada, 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 et cetera, et cetera. And you can also find me at my website, Carrie Barrett Consulting. My email is Carrie at Carrie Barrett Consulting and my phone, my, my work cell, 973-210-4952. Although nobody ever calls, they always message, <laughs> which is fine with me. Great. You guys, thank you so much. Thank you. And wonderful. Thank you. Great. To get you into the studio, yeah. honestly, and very educational for us and our audience, too. So, thank you very much for joining us today. This is Passage to Profit with Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart. It's the Inventor Show. We'll be right back after this. What are entrepreneurs' most valuable assets? Their passion and ideas. We can't protect your passion, but we can protect your ideas. Trust Gearhart Law to protect your ideas with premier patent, trademark, and copyright services. There's never been a better time to start your own business. Contact us at gearheartlaw.com. At Gearheart Law, we have years of experience protecting entrepreneurs' ideas and brands using patent, trademark, and copyright protection. So if you have a new consumer product, a new software application that you're planning to build or sell, or a brand or company name that you want to protect, contact the experts at Gearheart Law. www.gearheartlaw.com. Don't let the wrong protection strategy ruin your business. All of our attorneys are passionate about protection and are licensed and qualified to represent you before the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Don't start your project without calling us first. Contact Gearheart Law on the web at G-E-A-R-H-A-R-T-L-A-W.com. Together, we can change the world. This ad has been read by a non-attorney spokesperson. Hey, what's going on? It is the Mohawk and Real Talk and Living Fully Business Bully, Dave Anderson. And I love Passions to Profit. It's an amazing opportunity for entrepreneurs to put their businesses out there and get real sound advice from two of the best people in the business to help you protect your ideas and furnish your dreams in a way that is going to be spectacular. You have to check out this show. And please, just don't check out one episode. Don't just check out my episode, even though it's the best. I need you to subscribe right now. Now, go to wherever you listen to podcasts. I don't care if it's iTunes. I don't care if it's Google Play. I need you to subscribe because you need to feed your business needs. I'm telling you, this show is going to change the course of your life. Passage to Profit is it. I love it. Go get it. Listen to it. Woo! Now more with Richard and Elizabeth. Passage to Profit. So we also have more people to thank. Our media maven, Kenya Gibson, who is wonderful. Our fantastic producer, Noah Fleischman, who always makes us sound good, and the whole iHeart team. So don't forget to join us next week for another excellent speaker and another round of pitches. And listeners, you can start thinking about what your pitch will be. And don't forget to like us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. This is Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart on iHeart Radio with Passage to Profit, WOR 710, the voice of New York. Mm-hmm.